this tutorial, I wanted to go into more detail about how to pick flies in specific locations. Um, you know, what flies to use, why, where, and how. Um, I tend to ramble, but hopefully you guys find this educational. Uh, so without further ado, I'll jump right into it. What kind of aquatic life typically exists here? You know, do I have leeches? Do I have crayfish? Do I have damsels, uh, mayflies, uh, mosquitoes, uh, coronamids, midges? I mean, just all kinds of different um, life that exists there. Um, the carp are going to eat them all, the worms, whatever it is. Whatever food source, protein source exists in that water system, the carp are going to eat it. Um, and they are not particular about time of year. Now, you may have times of year where, say, like damsel larvae are more active than other times of the year. And during that time of the year, yeah, you probably want to throw something that is represents a damsel in some way. Um, but even then carp are not like trout will sometimes super focus in on a specific type like like if there's midges hatching um and then maybe a some kind of mayfly event happens they may not switch to that mayfly event they may be focused in on those midges and not switch and at the same thing they they may be focused on the mayflies and they won't switch to the midges um you do run into that with trout so bass are more similar in that bass are quite a bit more opportunistic than trout um, they're more like carp in that way. One of the big differences is, is a bass is going to be much more prone to attack aggressively longer distances um, than a carp will. You know, carp, you really got to get it right in their face for them to eat it. But, but the way they eat is more similar to a carp. A carp or, or a bass are much more opportunistic. You know, they will eat various food sources where, again, trout, trout tend to focus in on something, um, especially on the surface. Less so underneath um, on your subsurface. Um, but even then, you know, they, they too tend to get pretty hyper-focused on a particular type of food source. So one of the things that makes catching trout quite challenging. Um, so from a fly selection standpoint, carp are not as challenging. Um, there are a lot of carp flies out there and there's more that come out all the time. Um, most of them are going to be designed to be impressionistic. You know, most of them aren't a real food source. Um, like your hybrid hybrid flies, right? They kind of represent a worm. They kind of represent something burrowing down, which could be like a leech um, or a crayfish or something like that. Um, they, there's no bug that a hybrid fly is representing. Um, and most carp flies are that way. They're not, they're not actually representing any specific pattern. Um, now you can use traditional patterns for carp. Um, you know, I, when people usually ask me, hey, you know, I wanna try this carp fly fishing thing, you know, what can I use? Well, first thing I tell them is just, just take a leech or a small woolly bugger. Um, those are great patterns for carp and virtually everywhere that carp exist, that is gonna represent some kind of food source that they see, whether that is a leech, a crayfish, um, a minnow of some kind. Um, yeah, but something that they're going to see in their environment. So those are those are good options to use in those situations. Um, just to go out and give it a shot. If, if, if you just want to try it, you know, grab a leech, grab a small woolly bugger and, and go out and give it a shot. Um, if you want to get more serious about it and get into flies that to me are going to be more optimized for carp fly fishing, that's when you start looking at how the flies are constructed. And again, so if you go look at, at hybrid flies and, and the different carp flies that are out there, most of them are tied with some variation of either bead chain or dumbbell eyes. Um, and the reason that they're, those are on there is to flip that fly over in the water so that it lands with those bead chains down and the hook facing up. Um, the main reason is that we're not snagging crap on the bottom, right? So when you twitch it on the bottom or something, you can move it a little bit before you start getting into stuff and getting it stuck. Um, and that's a style that's been used for bonefish for, for quite a long time. Now, the flies that I like the most are gonna be very similar to bonefish patterns. Um, something like a Crazy Charlie or a Gotcha, but tied in colors that are more natural for the environment the carp live in. Um, from what I found, black tends to be the most consistent producer, especially if the water's off color. Um, black is, is my go-to color. In fact, I rarely 
start with anything but black. So, so how, what do I do when I get to a new location? How do I approach it? How do I determine what kind of fly I'm going to put on? Um, and, and, and what I'm going to do there, you know, I don't show up and then just slap a fly on to a certain extent. I may kind of have an idea, um, of what I'm going to be facing when I get there. So I might throw something on, I mean, it's one fly. It's not like you're setting up a nymph rig with multiple flies and indicator and, you know, weights and everything else, right? It's one fly. So, so sometimes I'll slap a fly on as I walk down to the water, but, but really I want to go down and I want to look and see, um, a couple of things on the water before I get there. And keeping in mind that, you know, I, I, I do also kind of want to pay attention to what kind of food sources are available, but, but most of the West, um, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, um, Montana, those areas have a lot of the same general, um, aquatic life in, in virtually any water you go to. So you kind of have an idea for carp before you get there that, you know, there's likely going to be leeches. There's likely going to be damsels. There's likely going to be mayflies. You know, you're going to have some things in there that you kind of know about. But so I walk down to the water usually, and I look to see kind of what I'm looking at, um, from an aquatic life standpoint, from, um, a current standpoint, right? Um, and I'm looking at this more from a still water approach, stocking in, in water that isn't moving a lot. You know, it might be on a river, but if I'm on a river, then I'm usually targeting areas where the water's not moving very much um, or on lakes. And, and sometimes lakes have quite a bit of current, right? So, but, I, but I'm looking to see what kind of water movement is here. Um, what kind of depth do I think the carp are going to be at? Um, and what kind of structure am I going to be dealing with? when I'm fishing for the carp. And that, and that will determine what type of flies I'm typically going to be throwing. Now, um, so let's say I get down to the water and I see a lot of carp swimming just below the surface, okay? Um, and it looks like they're feeding. You know, sometimes carp are cruising around, they're not eating at all. You can usually see their mouths open and close and it's pretty obvious if they're eating uh, when they're just below the surface. Um, so if I see that and I determine, oh, now, I may not make a decision right away and, and say, you know, I'm going to go after those fish. I might look to see, you know, those ones are on the surface, but what do I got tailing, you know, subsurface? I don't see anything tailing. I think, okay, I, the subsurface fishing where they're just below the surface is not my favorite. Um, but I mean, I'm going to do whatever is required at a particular situation to get a fly in front of a fish. So, so if I see them just subsurface, then I'm going to tie on a blind fly. So a blind fly are the flies. Uh, I think I've shown them um, that have no weight. So like in that case, just like a traditional little black, uh, black and red semi seal leech or, you know, lots of different leech patterns. That's a good pattern for that. Now this also does a pretty good job of being impressionistic of a damsel fly. So that'll work for a damsel imitation as well. Um, little leech patterns. So now I'm covering what they're likely feeding on or something they might be feeding on just subsurface. I mean, I, it could be quite a bit smaller than this. In fact, most likely it is going to be smaller than this. But something that I also try to do is throw patterns that I can see. Um, I, and I know that is a challenge, but the better I can see my fly and the fish, the more likely I am to actually be able to see that take and make sure that I'm getting that fly right in front of the fish. Um, so, so that's the way I'm going to look at fly selection. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I want to go as big as I can see, not in all situations, but typically I'm going to start there. And then if I'm getting a bunch of refusals, then I'll downsize and I'll go to a smaller fly. And then I'm more guessing, right? And I make a cast, I pull it over into, um, the lane, the carp swimming through, if it's just subsurface and I'm kind of watching for the mouth to open. And then I'm going to give it a little strip set. Um, Sometimes that strip set will trigger the carp to come eat it too, right? I don't want to give it a long one, but just give it a little strip set. Okay, so let's talk about the next scenario. So I come to a location and I'm seeing the fish um, tailing and they're in maybe two feet of water. You know, maybe this area has a lot of that, um, you know, two feet of water. And I don't have very much current. Um, and, and, and I don't have a lot of structure either that I'm going to be dealing with in that situation. So, so, so I, I can see fish, um, you know, I don't have weeds like all the way up to the surface. There might be weeds and stuff in there, but they're not all the way up to the surface. Um, and, and, and the reason that matters is so that the fly can move through, you know, different areas to get in front of the carp without catching on stuff. 
Um, in that situation, I'm, I'm gonna usually throw um, my mono eye fly or potentially a bead chain, depending on the depth. You know, the deep, if it's a little bit deeper, then I'll probably go to a bead chain. If it's fairly skinny in that situation, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw the mono. And that's really gonna be the case anywhere from that about two foot range all the way up to that like six inch range. Um, and I do target fish in six inch and, and they're pretty hard to get to, to eat in those places, but they sure are a lot of fun. Um, and that's where I really like to use my light flies. Um, now, so, so again, foot, maybe from two feet up to just the subsurface flies, that's kind of where I'm gonna look at those mono eyes or, or um, full pearl eyes. Okay, so when I get a little bit more than that, a little bit more in depth than that, um, that's when I transition and I'm, I'm gonna be pretty consistently using either my bead chain or into my dumbbell eyes. Um, you know, and again, it all comes down to what depth are these fish really at and what am I dealing with to get it down to them? If it's pretty calm water, then, and, and again, there's not a ton of structure in there up to the surface, and it, but, but I'm fishing a little deeper, then the bead chain is a, is a pretty good weight to use in that situation. Um, but if it's got a lot of weeds and stuff like that in it, coming up near the surface where, where I may have to like drag it through some of them, um, which, which you're gonna have to do fly fishing for carp. You know, you're gonna have to work a fly through weeds to get it in front of a fish. Um, then I want one that has a little bit more weight. Um, it just gives you a little bit of strength on your line because you're pulling that fly with some weight through those and they'll kind of push through a little bit better to drop it and drop them in. Um, in that, you know, even, even like 18 inches, if it's got a lot of structure in there, then I, I more typically am going to use something with a little bit more weight just so I can pull the fly in a little bit better. Um, with the really light stuff, sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll be pulling and it'll catch something and then it will pop and go a really long distance. Well, I don't want it to do that. I just want it to move a little bit. And if you have a fly with a little bit more weight, you're going to be able to move it through the structure a little bit better. Um, so you can see there's a lot that kind of goes into determining what fly weight I'm going to be using. Now, in this situation, these may all be carp malls and all might be the exact same fly pattern. I'm using in all these various different situations. I'm just adjusting for the weight that I'm using. Um, and that's a pretty key thing to remember that the patterns don't matter as much for the carp. The weight matters, the size matters, the pattern itself is not nearly as critical. As long as it's representative of something they may eat, then, then it should be fine. Um, so if I have a lot of current now, say we have a lake here, uh, Bear Lake, it's a big round lake. Um, it can get a lot of current um, moving just because there's nothing that breaks it up. So you might have waves coming in. And, I mean, it's almost like being on like the Caribbean, like the, 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 the ocean, maybe not the, you know, where you get in the Atlantic side coming in, but maybe on like the leeward side on a Caribbean island where you've got some waves and some current, but it's not a ton. But it's enough that it, it can be pretty difficult to accurately drop your fly down to the fish, um, that's going to be a situation where I'm going to use a, a heavier bead chain or a heavier dumbbell, not a bead chain. You know, I'm going to be up into those small um, dumbbell eyes um, or maybe even up to like a medium or a large if they're pretty deep in that situation. Um, you know, sometimes in a, in a bigger lake like that, you might find them out on flats or transition areas where it might be five or six feet deep. You know, if I'm fishing that kind of depth, then for sure, I'm looking at bead chain, the heavier stuff to get them down there. Um, and, you know, that's kind of an overview of how I approach sizing my flies for various areas. Now, another thing I look at when I am fishing a particular spot, I, I really like light flies when they kind of flutter down in front of the fish more. It's a slower sink rate. Um, sometimes the carp won't like that. And so then I'm going to be paying attention to, you know, what do they like? Do, do, if it's coming down slowly in front of them and maybe I put it in front of a couple fish and they've all turned away from that slow sinking fly, well, then I may try a heavier fly to see if that same pattern, heavier, dropping faster in front of them makes them have to react faster. Um, and then I'll use, it, use a heavier fly in that situation, regardless of what the water is telling me I probably should be doing. Um, I typically am not going to go lighter in an area where I would be using a heavier fly because it, there's so many other issues like accuracy. I, I can't use a light fly if I have a lot of current or, or if I've got the structure in the water that I'm trying to pull the fly through. I, light fly just doesn't, doesn't work as well that way. Um, 
but you know, so, so again, there's a lot of like variables that you have to look at at these different locations to determine exactly what fly to use. So I've kind of beat around a bush quite a bit on this on fly selection. And, and, and the reason is, is there's not like a super fly or a fly you should use in every situation. Um, with carp, again, more than any other species of fish that I've ever fished for, they are the most opportunistic. They are going to eat it if you can get it in front of them um, and something isn't going to spook them. Um, you know, make a good cast, drag and drop. Carp doesn't know you're there. You drop it down within a foot of their face. A lot of times you're going to get a strike. The majority of times that carp is going to eat your fly. What happens most of the time is that we mess up somewhere up to that point. And so it doesn't matter that we now we've got that fly close to them. We've messed it up. And, and they may not swim off when we first spook them, but something has alerted the carp that we're there or that a predator is in the area, so a threat is in the area, um, and they're not gonna eat. So usually when you get a refusal, that's what's happened. Um, and if you, fish for them a lot, you'll start to recognize that body language change. Um, it can be pretty subtle, um, but I mean, some of the things that you can look for is, right, maybe they've got a cloud coming out because they're blowing, you know, digging something up, sucking a hole out so they can get some meat, food source in, tailing, and then all of a sudden that cloud goes away, but the fish isn't moving anymore. Well, it's probably spooked at that point because he's not actively feeding anymore. Or, you know, they're moving, stopping, moving, stopping, moving, stopping, and then all of a sudden they don't stop anymore, right? They just kind of keep swimming. Well, you probably spooked them. Um, I, and that's just a part of carp fly fishing. You know, um, it, it's something that you learn to recognize more, you learn to recognize what I'm doing that is causing it. Um, and it can be so many different things. It would be hard to make a video to say, you know, this is how you approach every carp situation. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you have to look at it and say, all right, how do I get my fly in front of this fish without it seeing me, without me making noise that it can hear? And they can hear quite well when you make noise above. Um, you know, if you're out there playing your music, you're probably not gonna catch any carp. Um, you're talking to your buddy, like I'm talking to you right now, you're probably not gonna catch any carp. Um, they can hear extremely well. So, th so any vibrations at all that are abnormal are gonna put carp off. So just keep that in mind. Uh, as far as carp pattern goes, really honestly, it is not that critical. It's part of the reason that I mostly use carp malls and variations of carp malls. You know, I use olive and tan and brown and black and carp malls because they work. They work everywhere I've been. Um, they're impressionistic. Are they an exact pattern of anything? No, they're kind of a leech. They're kind of a damsel. They're kind of a crayfish. I, if I was to tell someone tie a bunch of flies, I would tell them tie the carp maul, tie it with and without rubber legs, tie it in black, olive, tan, brown, rust, and white, and tie it with mono eyes, faux pearl, bead chain eyes, the 3.2 millimeter bead chain eyes, and with small dumbbell eyes. You can fill your whole box with those and they're gonna work. Um, they just are. I, I, I've never been anywhere yet where a variation of that pattern hasn't worked. Now there are times when rubber legs seem to put the fish off. There's other times where I've never seen them move so aggressively and come so, so much when I throw up rubber legs versus no rubber legs. Uh, it just gives it extra movement. It also does a little bit better job of like tentacles and stuff like, not tentacles, but the uh, antenna and stuff like that you might see, or, or the pinchers on a, a crayfish, or legs. I mean, the movement, uh, rubber legs give it some more movement. So um, that would be my suggestion. If you wanted to tie some flies to get ready for next year, um, tie some kind of Crazy Charlie type pattern and tie it in those handful of colors and tie it with and without rubber legs and you'll be set next year. As far as sizes go, uh, it is probably good to tie it into in some multiple sizes. Um, you know, I have some pretty big ones down to like some twos and fours, but I really rarely, rarely, rarely ever use anything that big. Um, most of the time I'm gonna be using eight, 10, 12 um, will be the size I would be looking at. 
So if you were gonna wanna tie a bunch that you could use, maybe tie a bunch of eights and a bunch of 12s, and you'd probably be set for the year. Um, but that would be my recommendation. So anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this um, or at least found it educational. Um, I'll keep trying to provide stuff uh, that helps you get ready for the next carp season. Or if you're one of the lucky people that are in an area where you're carp fishing right now, I'm pretty jealous. <laughs> um, but yeah, apply it. Let me know if it works in your part of the country. I've never fished for carp in the Southern Hemisphere or the part of the world. I've never, I've never uh, fished down there. Um, I, I've tropical fish, you know, I, I've done, but I've never done, uh, I've never done, uh, you know, trout or carp or anything in the Southern Hemisphere. Love to, haven't yet. So uh, anyway, thanks guys. Uh, get some more content out and I will see you next time.